Hello and welcome to McRoberts Live Bite Sized, where we cover the key issues of the day in a short question and answer format. Today's Bite Sized episode is the last in our regular COVID-19 series, which has been released on a regular basis since the coronavirus outbreak began in March. We will still be aiming to bring you timely insights on the key points you should be aware of and action you can take in relation to issues affecting you and your business as a result of COVID-19. However, this will take the form of our written e-updates moving forward, as well as our usual monthly webinar updates, which will begin from August as coronavirus-related employment news winds down. I'm Megan Jenkins, a solicitor in the employment law team, and I'm joined today by Eleanor Mannion, who's a senior associate in our team. Please note that this content was accurate on 24th July 2020, when this episode was recorded. This is a high-level commentary of the latest legal position. It is for guidance only and is not legal advice. this episode we are going to provide another update on the ever-changing coronavirus job retention scheme as we are largely emerging from lockdown. This will cover particularly the changes from the past three weeks. We will then move on to discuss the topics that received the most votes in our bite-sized survey released last week. So the winners of this were a tie between dealing with flexible working requests and refusals to return to work. So we will discuss both in this webinar. So to move on to our furlough leave update, Eleanor is going to provide us with this. So Eleanor, what is new in the world of furlough? Okay, yes, furlough, ever-changing. Um, and July has provided us with a move to um, flexible furlough. Uh, this particularly as uh, Scotland has moved into phase three of its coronavirus route map, and which has seen a large number of businesses being able to reopen. So last week, we saw the return of outdoor sports, dental practices, non-essential shops inside of shopping centres, and face-to-face -face youth work all reopening on the 13th of July. Given the time of year it is, it's great to see that holiday accommodation and indoor hospitality is now opened. And for a number of us concerned about our roots, hairdressers now opened, museums, libraries, cinemas, and childcare provided providers all permitted to reopen on the 15th of July. This week has also showed further easing with motorcycle instruction, universities, colleges and personal retail services such as beauticians were permitted to reopen from the 22nd of July. So in terms of phase three, this leaves a small amount of businesses from continuing in one way or another. And it's anticipated that non-essential offices will be permitted to reopen during August, along with some live events and driving lessons. And it's hoped that from the 11th of August, children can return to school on a full-time basis. I'm sure something a lot of homeschooling uh, parents are very excited about. And then with the changes, with the, the various phases on lockdown, we've seen um, the changes to the flexible furlough scheme, which began on the 1st of July. And this has really assisted in allowing businesses to reopen while retaining the benefit of having staff on furlough where necessary. So it's all moved from having people on furlough permanently to being allowed to do some work for the employer while continuing to be on furlough leave. Flexible furlough and the regular full furlough option will continue to be available until the 31st of October. There have also been some changes to payment under the coronavirus job retention scheme. These changes are felt by the employer only, however, as the employee will continue to receive 80% of their wages up to £250,000 until the end of the scheme. Obviously, if they are on the flexible furlough scheme, they will be paid while they are working and then the 80% will refer to that period where they are not working on furlough. Beginning in August, employers must pay national insurance and pension contributions, which was previously covered by the coronavirus job retention scheme. September sees the first reduction in the HMRC 80% payment, which drops to 70% requiring employers to do the top up of the amount by the remaining 
and then October reduces this further to 60, requiring employers to pay 20% of the furloughed wages. The UK government has additionally announced some incentives to help businesses across the next few months, and this includes a job retention bonus, which means that businesses can claim £1,000 per employee who was brought back from the furlough scheme and remains employed through to January 2021. The bonus is aimed at offsetting some of the additional requirements towards the tail end of the coronavirus job retention scheme, and it is hoped will save some employees from redundancy. It will be paid out in January 2021, subject to the employees, employees receiving at least £525 per month. Thank you for that, Eleanor. And I think it is very important to note that the reduction in the contribution from HMRC doesn't equate to an equivalent reduction in payment from the employer and that employees will still be entitled to either receive the 80% of normal salary or the £2,500 per month, whatever is lower. So I think that's very important to bear in mind. So employers will still be required to top that up. So. As we emerge into the new normal, where everything is not quite the same and many of us are still working at home, managing childcare and homeschooling responsibilities, as well as other caring responsibilities, the workplace doesn't look the same as it did in the pre-coronavirus and pre-lockdown. And one thing that's at the forefront of everyone's minds is flexibility. So employers themselves have been very flexible in terms of arranging home working or adjustments to hours. But one way that employees can request changes to their working time or environment can be through a flexible working request. So Eleanor, what is a flexible working request? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And as you say, people are um, looking to, to what their work life is like. And flexible working is the term used where employees want to vary the nature of their attendance requirements at their place of work or their hours of work. And during the pandemic, it's resulted in most workplaces changing drastically. And it's speculated that an effect from this is on a return to the workplace, there's going to be a greater number of flexible working requests by employees who've experienced the potential advantage that this can bring. So flexible working isn't limited to one method and it can incorporate a whole host of options such as job sharing or part-time work, compressed hours where you do your normal working week over a shorter number of longer days, changes in work pattern or working from home. And coronavirus has provided a, in some case, unwelcome test run in maximizing the flexible working arrangements of many employers. With the uncertainty surrounding the future of the traditional workplace, now is the time to plan ahead and consider as an employer, how can you accommodate flexible working requests and make the best use out of flexible working requests and arrangements? So how do flexible working requests work? So employees have a statutory right to request that they participate in some form of flexible working if they have been with their current employer for at least 26 weeks, so that's about six months. Employees are only permitted to make one statutory uh, request for flexible working in every 12 months. It used to be the case that to make a flexible working request, it had to be for childcare reasons or for other caring reasons. But now any employee can make such a request so long as they've been employed for that 26 week period. If an employee is making an application, making a request, it must include a number of uh, particular things. So the application must be in writing, it must be dated. Uh, you need to state that it's an application made under this statutory procedure and it should also specify the change that the employee is seeking and when they wish for this change to take effect. The application must also explain what effect, if any, the employee thinks that the change would have on the employer and how any such effect could be dealt with. Pretty much that's like a little business case. And Finally, the employee should state whether they have previously made an application to the employer and if so, when. So that's very interesting to know. So when an employee makes a valid flexible working request, how should this then be handled by the employer? 
The key word in employment law generally is reasonableness, and this applies here as well. Employers have a duty to handle requests in a reasonable manner. It doesn't mean that they have to grant every re request, but they need to consider it reasonably. And I'm going to go through later a list of um, the reasons why they would not accept a request. So in the first instance, they should discuss the request with the employee, ideally at a meeting. If we're still in um, a work from home situation, that meeting can be done by video conference or by, by phone. The employee should be accompanied by or allowed to be accompanied by a work colleague or a trade union representative. And the employee should be informed prior to the meeting taking place, the purpose of that meeting and, you know, arrange for an appropriate venue, date and time, etc. Once the request has been discussed, the employer has a decision period of three months and that three months begins with the date of the employee's request or such longer period as the parties may agree. So employers do need to deal with it and within a set time frame. There's no statutory requirement for a trial period for the flexible working itself. However, it may be beneficial to both parties to see how their proposed arrangements work in practice. And it's a good way to get employer and employee buy-in by having a trial. An approved, refer sorry, an approved request is treated as a variation to the employee's contract and will be a permanent change. Because of this, the employer is obliged to issue a section one statement within one month of the changes taking effect. The employer may also wish to issue a letter, sorry, or a new contract of employment, although this is not required. Instead of issuing a new contract, you could cover this off by issuing a letter referring to the change with the introduction of the flexible working practice, noting that the rest of the terms and conditions in the original contract are still in force. As I mentioned at the outset, an employer isn't obliged to approve every request made but there are only specific circumstances in which a statutory flexible working request can be rejected. And so these are uh, the, the refusals that an employer can apply. So if there are already planned structural changes, which would not work with a flexible working request, if there is a burden of additional costs, if quality or standards will suffer, if they won't be able to recruit additional staff, particularly in a job share situation, if performance will stuff, suffer, if the employer won't be able to reorganize work amongst existing staff, or if they will struggle to meet customer demand. And finally, if there is a lack of work during the periods within which the employee proposes to work. This isn't the, the final uh, point for an employee, however, as they can appeal a rejected request. Although this isn't specifically provided for in the legislation, it would keep, be in keeping with the reasonableness standards of employment law. And ACAS suggests that a right of appeal is essential to flexible working requests under the Employment Rights Act 1996. An appeal meeting should be arranged and heard by someone not involved with, in the original process if possible. If an employee withdraws a request, they are prevented from making another until 12 months from the date of withdrawal has taken place. This withdrawal can be in writing by the employee or by a failure to attend any of the scheduled meetings. So aside from the general reasonableness um, that the employer must consider the request in. Are there any other issues that employers should be aware of or consider around flexible working requests? Yes, even if the refusal doesn't meet the statutory, sorry, if the refusal doesn't meet the statutory criteria, so that list that I discussed earlier, then an employee can make a claim to the employment tribunal stating that, you know, this hasn't been dealt with properly or reasonably. Um, and if they are successful in that claim, they would be entitled to um, compensation of eight weeks pay with an upper limit of £538 per week applied to that payment. There's also a risk of indirect discrimination. And this is particularly important when the employee is setting out why they're looking for a flexible working request. So for example, women are more likely to have childcare responsibilities. And so if a, requ a request is refused without justification, 
there may be indirect discrimination claims arising from that. It's really important to take into account discrimination elements and inferences of discrimination, particularly indirect discrimination, because compensation for discrimination claims is potentially uncapped and can include compensation for injury to feelings. So it can be an expensive mistake for an employer to make. Yeah, it's, it certainly does sound so. And, and I think this will become a lot more common and employers having to deal with these sorts of requests um, post pandemic in this new normal that we have. Thank you for that. So now to move on to what to do if an employee refuses to return to work. A major concern for businesses returning to the workplace is that employees may not be quite as keen to continue business as usual on the basis of concerns for their own safety. Employers can do their best to inform employees of the changes that have taken place within a place of work to comply with social distancing and hygiene requirements. However, they, this may not be enough to entice an employee in some cases, so those who are especially nervous about coming back due to the risk of any kind of coronavirus or perceived risk that they have. Communication and understanding of an employee's circumstances is critically important in this instance, as taking a hardline approach may further exacerbate any issues and provide the opposite of the intended effect being to get the person back to work. So Eleanor is going to answer a few questions on this. So Eleanor, what circumstances affect an employee refusing to return to work? I think what you, you've said out here, Megan, is so important to bear in mind this issue of going back to a new normal and whether things are automatically going to switch back to how life was in February 2020. And I think it's really important for both employer and employee to understand the different circumstances that both groups will find themselves in. So the the tenor of discussion and the, the watchwords from government for the last number of months is that the safest place for people to be is in their home and to not to venture out. And now we're talking about getting back to work, being in, you know, premises and an environment where you're not in control of hygiene and, and who's coming in and out, of getting back on public transport, of queuing for your morning coffee and getting your lunch. And so that's some of the stuff that employees are going to have in their mind in terms of their concerns. And yes, employers will also absolutely be concerned with the, these points, but their focus also is on the economy and the impact on their business and trying to return to a profitable area of business. So I think it's important that both groups consider the position that each are in so that that open communication and understanding of circumstances um, is taken into account. I think an employer, um, they're not going to know everything about their employees, but they should explore why it is that maybe an employee is saying, I'm concerned or I'm not sure about a return to work. And one of the key things might be the employee's mental health. If an employee is suffering from a mental health issue, such as anxiety or depression, this might result in them wishing to not return to the workplace. It might be that the thoughts of returning to the workplace are exacerbating symptoms, or it may be that the isolation caused by lockdown has impacted on their mental health and made that position worse for them. And so if an employee is saying, look, from a mental health perspective, I'm not too sure whether I can return to work, then an employer should uh, look to take up an occupational health report to determine A, if the mental health issue qualifies as a disability, and B, if as a result of that, any reasonable adjustments might need to be made. Also, we're, we're slap bang in the middle of school holidays. So if employers are requiring a return to work, is it the case that employees who have, whether children or shielding family members to take care of, whether they still have those responsibilities and should that be taken into account by the employer. So measures such as emergency or unpaid leave uh, may be required to accommodate the employee's responsibilities. This is particularly the case if nurseries or childcare um, facilities are not fully open. 
And then there's the point about existing health issues. So if an employee has a pre-existing uh, medical condition, which doesn't necessarily place them in a shielding category, but still makes them more vulnerable than others, they might be cautious about presenting at their place of work, even if a number of precautions have been put in place. And so the employer should discuss with the employees who have these health issues to determine what measures are being put in place to make them more comfortable. And then finally, harassment. It's really unfortunate that with COVID-19 and the coronavirus pandemic, we've seen an increase in potentially racist activity due to its initial prevalence in, in Asia. Some members of the public have taken the very uninformed opinion that those of Asian descent may be carriers of the virus and uh, subject them to abuse at their workplace as a result. And so this may result in some staff members wishing to stay at home to avoid the chance of abuse being directed at them. In the first instance, employers need to remember uh, their obligations under the Equality Act, and that includes uh, their obligations in terms of harassment. A zero tolerance approach should be taken and communicated to all staff members. And if uh, this harassment is coming from members of the public, uh, then they should be reminded that staff members should not be subject to abuse. Training may also be desired if such instances occur between employees and colleagues should look out for one another when dealing with customers. So those are some of the circumstances that might be in an employee's, might be the basis for uh, a refusal to return to work initially. So this brings us on to the important question of can an employee refuse to come to work? In short, yes, but in very limited circumstances. And those points that I've raised in the previous wouldn't be a basis for a refusal. The basis is going to be on health and safety grounds. All employers have a statutory duty to ensure the health, safety and welfare of their employees while at work. Normally, if an employee were to leave work in the middle of the day or refuse to come to work, that would be an unauthorized absence and it would have implications for the employee, both in terms of their wages and disciplinary action. However, it's recognized that in situations of serious and imminent health and safety issues, an employee should have protection against detriment and dismissal and may be permitted to refuse to return to work. And so this is provided for by section 44 of the Employment Rights Act, which states, in circumstances of danger, which the employee reasonably believed to be serious and imminent, and which the employee could not reasonably have been expected to avert, the employee left or proposed to leave, or while the danger persisted, refused to return to their workplace or the dangerous part of their workplace. And if that happens, then an employee cannot suffer detriment or dismissal as a result. Now, this section of the Employment Rights Act isn't actually commonly referred to or relied upon. It's not something that comes up a lot, mostly because it was only seen to be relevant to a particular group of workplaces. For example, where there's heavy machinery, which if damaged could cause injury to workers and employees, or where chemicals are used, which require careful safety careful storage or use, or for example, in construction where people are working at heights. It's all about, can the workplace result in an injury or even a death for the employee? So it's not expected that in the day-to-day -day work life of an employee in an office, a school or a shop, that there would be serious and imminent health and safety dangers. However, this has changed with COVID-19 and in particular with the language used by the government in introducing the lockdown because they discussed it as a serious and imminent threat which required to be averted. And so that mirrors the language in section 44 which talks about serious and imminent dangers. So there is the potential that an employee will rely on this section of legislation to push back against a return to the workplace. However, this does not mean that every refusal will come under that section or will be permitted. And again, we're going to come back to this concept of reasonableness. And the key element in a section 44 refusal is whether there is a reasonable belief of the employee. Do they reasonably believe that there will be a serious and imminent danger which they cannot reasonably avert? 
the fact that there are still coronavirus cases in Scotland and the UK and a fear of contracting coronavirus might not be enough. As an employer, as I mentioned, you've got obligations in terms of health and safety. And part of that includes an obligation to undertake risk assessments and consult with employees on new measures brought into place in respect of health and safety. Where an employer has assessed risks, has put in place through consultation with the employees, measures such as increased cleaning or hygiene, staggered start and finish times, reducing access to communal spaces or machinery, use of PPE, including face coverings, etc., and has provided all of that information to the employee, then it is going to be more difficult for an employee to assert a reasonable belief in serious and imminent danger. However, that is not to say that if an employee says they are not coming back to work because they believe they'll be in danger, and if an employee has undertaken a risk assessment, they can simply disregard the employee's concerns out of hand. To do that would not be a reasonable action. As with everything in employment law, reasonableness comes into play and the employer should speak to the employee to get an understanding about the concerns that they have and to assess if those concerns are reasonable. And in some circumstances, you're going to need to take legal advice on that so that you can decide as an employer how you want to move forward. If as an employer, you assert that those, um, that the belief is not reasonable, then there is the potential to discipline that employee who refuses to continue to come to work or to not pay them and class that as an unauthorized absence. Uh, during this uh, discussion period with the employee, notes should be taken so that uh, if an employee maintains the position um, that they can make a reasonable refusal to return to work. And if the employer either does not pay them, disciplines them or dismisses them, it's likely that employee will raise an employment tribunal claim. And it's always helpful to have contemporaneous notes of what was discussed and the basis for decision making, which will help defend a claim. Essentially, as an employer, you need to act reasonably, do not make a knee-jerk reaction, and consider uh, carefully the points that the employee is raising in, in relation to the health and safety concerns that they are making. And so that's really a whistle-stop tour on whether an employee can refuse to return to work and what an employee should do in the circumstances. Back to you, Megan. Great, thank you very much for that, Eleanor. That was very thorough on both topics. And I hope everyone listening found this update to be useful. For more information, if you have any questions or feedback, or if our employment law team can be of any assistance, please email us at employmentlive at Thank you for listening, and we look forward to bringing you our next monthly webinar.